Hi there, my name is Creston. I'm um, CTO in this company called Humio. Um, and I'm here to talk about understanding locked data. So, um, first of all, I'll just, uh, just a very quick agenda of these next 40 minutes. Just a bit who we are. I'll do a super, super quick demo for you because um, this is really a talk about this product that we built and why we built it. Um, so a good chunk of it is actually our, our experiences and why we went about uh, doing this and then a bit about how it works. And we'll see if there's more time, we can, we can play around with it after that. So, <clears throat> so we're um, uh, fairly, we just came out public about our company uh, last week in Copenhagen. We've been r working on this for nine months. Uh, the core team is the three of us, where Gita has actually been a global manager for the GoTo conferences uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, I've been, I'm co-founder and was CTO of Trifork, which is now a 500 person consulting shop for the last 20 years. Um, so we decided to kind of break out uh, in, a, in a new startup, uh, picking up some of our experiences. So. Um, I'll start off with a short demo where I have, in this, in this little demo, uh, I have, uh, I'm pulling in data, the logs from GitHub because they're, they're publicly available. There's a public feed of live data coming out of GitHub that tells us all, all the pushes, all the likes, all the comments are all in, a, in, a, in, a, in an event stream that you can subscribe to uh, from GitHub. So. Um, just as an example of something that a lot of people can relate to. So the, um, the main API looks like this, uh, where uh, we have a time series over the last 24 hours, and then we have events that come, they come as JSON structures that um, go something like this. They're just a description of what happened. In this case, this was somebody forking um, a repository. So let's see, so it's, then the language up here is, uh, basically it's a, you could call it, a, it's a grep on steroids where we can uh, really fastly grep and, and do basic analytics on this data. So let's um, start by looking for um, anything that has to do with um, Docker. Right, so here we get an event distribution graph over the things that happened on the repository, Docker, Docker. Uh, you can go look at that. Or we could do um, simple group by um, the, types of, the types of events that happened at GitHub the last 24 hours. So these are uh, the number of, total number of events was about a million. And you can uh, take these and then sort them and we get them the most events like this, or we could do, we could take all the watch events, that's, the, um, that's the, when you like a GitHub repo, and say we want to group those by repository name and sort them so you get the most popular GitHub repos the last 24 hours, the ones that were the most watched. And you can take this over another time interval uh, and turn this into a live stream of data. So we just take this pipeline again over the, the live stream from GitHub, and as, as this 24 hour, this in this case a 15 minute window, you can see the, the count here will update as we go along at this time. So that's the basic idea. So let's get back to the presentation. We find it, it works well to just explain just briefly uh, what this is. So this all started the why uh, in building 24-7 systems. You know, and most interesting systems today are really composed of many servers, many services. Today is, you know, it's microservices, cloud, distributed systems. And logs are really a time-proven, lowest common denominator for understanding these systems, what's going on in a complex distributed system. Um, so 
starting out with locks, you get a really low barrier of integration, very easy integration point. And by aggregating locks, it's, it, we really found that this is key to understanding this kind of system. So really, a um, lot of the experiences is this is, um, comes around this system we started building around 10 years ago, which is uh, uh, the equivalent of NHS spine. So it's a, it's a prescription service, central prescription services, medication services, supervision of prescriptions, pharmacies, uh, et cetera, a centralized system that we've had in Denmark for the last 10 years. So this was one of our big, first big, uh, you know, 24-7 systems which were really mission critical, distributed in many ways. So it was really important to have availability. You know, you need uh, doctors at the emergency room to be able to, to prescribe drugs, even in the middle of the night, and to be able to look at people's prescription records. There's a lot of security requirements which made the DevOps uh, pretty cumbersome. Uh, lots of servers and many different kinds of services running on these systems. And also a thing that complicated it a lot is this was part of a distributed system where we only controlled a fraction of it because there was like 40-ish different systems at hospitals and, and doctors and various services that would interact with this and generate data that could flood and cause all kinds of issues. Um, so in this environment, and this was, you know, just when DevOps and distributed systems was really fairly new, uh, we, um, we set out and actually picked uh, a tool for doing log aggregation. Um, and what we found, here are some of the interesting things we found. Actually, even today, lots of people are not using log aggregation. So, so the, the most important thing you get when you have a log aggregation system is you you want to build a, have an idea of what's normal. So we set up this place in, uh, in the dev teams, which would show dashboards of how many transactions did we do today, what, what kinds of errors happened uh, today. And by having it visually right there in front of you, um, you get this sense of normal where you can take the AI of the brain uh, and actually apply, apply it there, and so you could immediately see the devs uh, could immediately see if something was different than it used to be. Um, so we put up dashboards. It could be something like, this is just a sample dashboard. It's, it's not from the actual system. But these visual things that you put up that makes it, uh, there's some information you can, your brain can, can process and look at and understand what's normal. Um, then, one of the most important metrics is something like just, you know, just transactions over the day, what's happening in the system. So this could be how many prescriptions are, are being prescribed to during the course of a day or the course of the week. This could be maybe this is lunch break. Everybody goes off for lunch break, so it's normal to have a, a dip around there. And then uh, a very, a very easy thing to, uh, to, to do is just add a trend line for the same day last week. So compared to, compared to last week, that's a, that's a super easy, it makes it very easy to see what goes on. And then, of course, every now and then you get weird things, like the first day after Christmas or the first day after Easter break, uh, typically the first day after, after break, lots of people are kind of they're aggregating their illnesses and they all come to the doctor at the, on the Monday or the Tuesday after the break. So you'll see these kinds of patterns. So they're off. Every, every now and then, this, doesn't, this isn't right, but, but in many cases, that's a very easy measure um, to just... You don't need uh, you know, fancy AI, you just need people actually looking at these graphs every day. It's very, very, very simple. So, another thing is, because of the security here, you know, there's really... Dev and ops were really divided, right, because this is like... Uh, Often in a bank environment, we had operations completely isolated from dev, uh, and everything ops was supposed to do went through a ticketing system. So you need to configure this, you need to install this. There's no tinkering around with anything because, of course, this is healthcare information. So we need exact tracking on who does what in, in, the, in the operations environment. So it turned out having access to the logs in the system, of course, with an audit record of who accessed which locks, what did they do, um, is, uh, is a nice read-only 
way of having access into the operations environment where you could still learn a lot about the system as it's running without having, you know, being afraid of touching something or, or making, uh, breaking things in, in the operation system. So, <clears throat> a key thing is to also be able to, with this system, be able to iterate and explore. So, you might already have uh, a metric system set up where you count, you know, how much CPU, how much disk, etc., uh, how much, uh, how many, how many um, transactions of various kinds that you have. But often, you know, the the cycle for adding extra information to this or explore things is is, is pretty uh, slow. So we often see that you know there's some team they'll go once and set up the dashboard and then you know you never go back and change it. Um, but we find that it's really um, super valuable that everyone, all the devs, can go build their own variations of dashboards to play around with it and easily extract new kinds of information out of, out of the log stream. Uh, and that might sound like it's difficult, but it's actually not. So, so this whole idea of being able to iterate and, and have an explorative um, kind of approach to to your metrics, to your logs, is, um, is really important. So you get um, very diverse. In this, our, you know, our healthcare system uh, was at least these kind, different kinds of, of services and systems. And you can imagine they each, for, to get data out of these of those, right? There's a different way of doing uh, various ways of things in these things. So by just taking the logs, and I mean the, the flat, files that come out of these systems. It's a very easy way to just take these logs and ship them. Now, the interesting thing is how do you make that into, uh, into some interesting data? And this is a place where various log aggregation systems differ quite, quite a bit. You know, in some cases, you have to configure the system to extract relevant information when the data comes in. Uh, but some of them also allow you to ad hoc and at a later point in time extract the data that you want. And that's, that's, that's a super flexible way of doing that. So you want to, uh, that's, that's something we learned, um, that being able to go back and say, I really wish I'd indexed that attribute and have that be something that's super easy to do, um, has a high value. So our engine, we want to, well, it turns out, uh, you know, there's, there's, of course, two major players out there. There's Splunk, there's uh, Elastic. Uh, and we found for many, uh, many of our customers didn't, weren't ready to, to pay for Splunk. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's pr priced by volume. And um, for various reasons, we found it, you know, especially on smaller accounts, difficult to, um, to get in. Um, for Elastic, uh, we also spend a lot of time uh, you know, deploying these systems. And they're, they're also, it's a bit tricky to r at least run your own. Um, uh, because there's so many moving parts. So we wanted to do something that's simple, you know, fast, flexible, affordable, simple to install and use uh, to get this, to get all these, all these benefits. Um, so, um, so Humio at the core of it is, um, let's say it's a time series text database. Uh, so, it's an in-memory stream processing thing, so it's like advanced event processing or bringing in these um, idioms and techniques from, you know, from f the financial high-frequency trading systems, KDB plus-ish uh, things, where instead of uh, doing a lot of indexing up front, um, we're actually just very fast at processing uh, data at brute force. Um, with some very, very simple high-level indexing, like time is the primary index that we have. It's only index, pretty much. So, <clears throat> so at the core, the engine is a HTTP JSON API thing, and then we have we build the front end for this. So let's look at little at what the queries look like. So we built um, a query language that kind of resembles, um, you know, Unix pipeline. You want to do grep into sort into unique into something. Um, so uh, a query that would look like this in SQL. 
select the average response time from the backend services where the URL looks like this. This could be a query to do, and the time is bigger than this, and we want to group it by the method, for instance. So you would write this in, uh, in this way in, in our query language. The first things are filters. We filter on tags and starting one day back. Um, we want to filter on that the URL is this, um, that starts with this, and then we just group by um, group the data by method, averaging on response time. So we find this is a very natural uh, way to think of it as uh, as a stream processing uh, language. You imagine kind of mentally that um, events enter all the events of the system enter through this pipeline, and the ones whatever comes out in the other end is the response of the um, of the query. And that applies both for like an ad hoc query and also for a standing query that just sits there as a, as a MapReduce pipeline or an event processing pipeline where events are fed into. Um, so the basic way how this works is um, we just store segments. In many ways, this is like how Kafka stores its data. Um, so we built our own backend where you, as you ingest data, uh, it's tagged with various tags. It could be front-end tags and data center tags like this. And they, for each combination of tags, enters becomes a stream of segments, kind of like a Kafka topic. Uh, and it's stored compressed. Uh, we can decompress it um, to, to process it. And then when a given query comes in, you s we saw before there's a... There's a set of text and a time range that could be the back end in this time interval from T1 to T3 that happens to match these segments of the, um, of the streams. So we just picked, we just brute force those, and inside these we have a, in each of these blocks that adds up to, uh, depending on the compression, somewhere between um, 50 and 100. Uh, megabytes for each of these segments. We have a little time index, so we can also um, just select as a portion of the data in one of these. So, other than that, once we once we do that, it, it, we actually just brute force uh, search, and I'll get back to how that's fast. But because we have the entire data set in, we can actually run interesting stuff like at full speed run a regular expression over the logs. So this is, the, um, this is the power of this flexibility is this is how we extract, you could say, we want to take the back end, we want to run a regex of there's some conference ID at this position in URLs, and then I want to group by that conference ID and select something, right? So you generate data out of this. So in many systems, you would, this, this would be really difficult because uh, you extract, you decide what to extract or what to index on when you ingest the data. But here we can actually at full speed run this. Um, um, yeah, so just a summary. Um, and it's like a Unix pipeline style, reactive event processing. We find that, uh, you know, many queries you want to do in these systems are, have an aggregate component anyway. Right, so you often you have to scan the data. Many realistic queries, of course it's nice in a, in a term index based system that you can very easily go to a specific request ID, find a specific record, um, and of course Elastic or the likes are faster at finding specific things. But uh, what often happens uh, is you want to do a graph over response times or do some some weird aggregation across our selection, so you have to scan the data uh, anyways. And then it becomes actually faster to just do, a s make sure you do serial reads from disk and are really careful to stay on cache, etc. And it's really super valuable to have the schema on query, you could say extract data out of the locks as you're processing it. Um, because it's like, a time it's like having a time machine, right? You can go back to a year ago and say, gee, I wish I indexed that attribute. Um, so 
how do we make this um, go fast? Uh, we apply a good dose of mechanical sympathy. So Jackie Stewart was this British um, Formula One driver um, in, who was really famous in the 60s. He, went, he, he won three world championships in Formula One. And the special thing about him in this context is he came up with this name of mechanical sympathy, arguing that you, know, you can drive better, you can be a better race driver if you really understand your car. So he really spent a lot of effort understanding the car exactly. Uh, you know, he, he was a mechanic himself. He, could, he understood every aspect of it and you be one with the car. So this, this idea applied in, in software systems, of course, has been... Um, you know, Martin Thompson has been walking around uh, talking about mechanical sympathy in terms of computers. Mostly uh, in terms of understanding what your CPUs look like, um, understanding what the caching infrastructure looks like, what, how to best access your data, put it on cores, uh, and because the, there's, there's almost an order of magnitude difference between accessing data on a local core uh, on the cache and in main memory. So if you can have data, uh, if you can have an active data set on, on a core that runs you know, much, much, much faster. And the key trick to making this brute force thing run fast is to have it compressed on disk, loaded up onto a core in small chunks where we then uncompress it because the bandwidth up is maybe a tenth, or 10x, because it, we load it up compressed, then we decompress it on the core, and then you have super fast access to run a regex over this little chunk, or run, extract, or, or, or do comparisons on, on the pieces of data. So of course, that's, um, that's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that, and also guessing, because you really, it's really difficult to, uh, to measure <laughs> these things. You just have to kind of feel like you're, are the, today I am the CPU, I, but uh, having this sympathy with, um, with the course. And uh, you can go online. My, my, uh, Martin has done several talks on uh, how to employ this uh, and how put it to use in various contexts. Um, so the <coughs> It's, it's really amazing how, uh, it's an it's, it's, it's interesting quote. The most amazing achievement of the computer software industry is its continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains made by computer hardware industry. You know, we've been so busy. You know, especially the last 10 years. We're building distributed systems, scale-out systems, um, and, and really not caring about uh, the hardware. It's, uh, you know, hardware is so cheap that we can just throw more hardware at it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes this gets to a point where it gets totally ridiculous. Um, because if you do things right, you can, you know, you can save an order of magnitude on, on systems. So our current finding is, you know, with Humio, we can also, you can save an order of magnitude on your servers. Right? You can turn five or ten servers into one. Um, by just doing the right thing. So, the, the gist of it is to get the raw speed in the code. You know, the active data set of inner loops fits on cache. You want to make sure you don't do any dynamic allocations in the inner loop. Once you set up, you can go, because allocations involve synchronization with other cores. You want to bind your stuff to core so that um, you don't the data doesn't move around, especially on, on multi-socket systems, memory banks get associated with the CPUs on the cores. Hyper threads are just in the way. If you can actually utilize your machine, uh, you know, it's just, it just half, gives you half the cache size. So the hyper threads are two threads that run on the same core. Um, using compressed storage, Actually, the biggest performance gain uh, we see constantly, or the biggest difference between different systems, is how good does, how well does the, the data compress. The more we can compress it, the better bandwidth we get all the way through up the I/O system, main memory to, to CPU. Uh, it almost doesn't matter how long time it takes to, to decompress it, but of course, fast decompression is, is important. And I think 
having fast decompression, that's going to be that's going to be an important thing in new hardware architectures uh, Intel, from Intel going forward. We, I'm certain we're going to see hardware-supported decompression uh, directly in hardware uh, because this is so important uh, to get everything out of the machine. Sequential read from disk, that's an old timer. So there's all these tricks in the book that you can, you can uh, listen to Martin's talk, uh, talks and, um, and, and learn it. So. On ingest, how does it work? Um, we have a bunch of HTTP JSON APIs, or you can use various other tools, like uh, we support Elastic's uh, bulk API and the FileBeat API, so you can use ex ex existing beats uh, from, from Elastic to load data in. Um, we can load NetFlow directly uh, from firewalls. Um, Syslog, etc. It's very easy for us to, of course, add new kinds of things like this. So, ingest performance. This is this is often one of the pain points of other alternative solutions. Uh, so, arriving data, we just process it really minimally and basically just compress it and persist it in an append-only fashion. So, we don't have any indexing, B tables, sorted on disks, things. Right, and you can easily do 100 gigs a day. Uh, per core on an ingest node. So this is, uh, this is often a pain point that you need you know, lots of big machines to sit there and take data in that you might never look at. Um, so the pipeline is quite simple. You can either go directly or via Kafka. Um, and if you, if you set it up through a Kafka, uh, this is actually showing that we, we, we try to stay out of the loop on this complexities of storing three copies and making sure that everything is consistent across different copies and bit rot and whatnot. So block stores are very good at, at saving extra copies of data. Kafka is also very good on taking this in-flight extra copies of data. So you can have, um, as data arrives, we can load it through Kafka. Humi just does the processing and builds up these segments and then pushes them off to a block store. So this block store could just be a file system uh, in a simple setup. And with that, uh, you know, with a, once it's a block is stored here, we can act it all the way through Kafka so we can release, um, release that, uh, those messages. Could be another messaging system. So basically, we try to stay out of the loop of being a, a complex distributed system, keeping three copies of all your locks, etc. If, in case you want that, we can offload that to other infrastructure surrounding it. Um, then, also, so this is what we're working on, uh, being able to run distributed queries. Actually, at this point, we, we, haven't, we don't have any, any examples of customers, so we actually have some pretty large ones, but uh, it, we... Uh, we don't have anywhere it has been a big issue that we can't query fast enough. So that being able to query fast enough uh, is, is, is going to be, it's, it, this is the next major feature we're building on, is be, being able to use the block store uh, and then essentially have a number of different query nodes that can just read out of the block store and can distribute a query over segments. So <coughs> the product we have today is, is just a single node. Um, that we deliver you know, online, hosted, or as a container for download on-premise. Uh, it's an important thing um, to have this on-premise solution because many of our customers, you know, they're in healthcare or they're in banking or something, want uh, to have their own lock data. And as I showed before, we have a demo system. Um, and we've spent the last two months almost doing nothing but writing documentation and kind of wrapping up things. But um, I think we can spend just five minutes on um, trying to go back and look at the, at the system. You can still hear me? So um, we saw here, this was the query to figure out what's uh, hot and not right now and get at GitHub. So imagine we want to figure out um, something more complex, like uh, I'd like to give an example of what a regex looks like. Um, so 
So these queries that go like this, we can you know we could we could visualize them differently. So if we take just uh, the ten most interesting ones and show that as a pie chart, then we get the ten most popular repos, whatever. We can put these on a dashboard. So a dashboard is just a collection of query results like this. So this is the uh, just a sample dashboard that shows the um, most watched today. That's what we talked about. The actual inflow of events right now uh, at GitHub. The, here's a query that shows the users that did the most comments today. Um, so let's see. We can open the query over here. So this takes all events that are comment events and group by the login, counting uh, how many of these there are, and then sort them. Another example here is um, most forked. So in here we have, we take all the events that are forked. So this is, um, if we, if we just write any text, then it becomes just a free text grep. If it has an equals in it somewhere here, then it's a more directed search for those attributes. Then we run a regex over these fork events. Like, let's try to look at what a fork event looks like. Comes here. Fork event has all this information, but most importantly, it has the repository that it pertains to, the ones that's forked. And it has a kind of an organization or user and then the repository name. So if we, ex if we want to extract that, I just run a regex over all these ones, uh, finding the repository name of something that comes after a slash. So this is the name group in a regular expression. Uh, and so after doing this, we have an, an extra attribute available that um, is, is the rep name, and then we can group by that. So this is disregarding who owns this repo, what are the different kinds of, uh, uh, what are the names of uh, repositories that get forked. And we could do this over you know, a longer time over the last week. Um, so this actually, uh, depending on the complexity of the query, of course, this easily runs at uh, 1.5 gig of ingest data per second per core. So in, this is a four core node we run at, uh, let's see, five gigabytes a second. Um, so if you want to run a similar complex system, I have a bigger, uh, I have a, I have a bigger server here. I was running here. Go. I want to log in. I have the, some GitHub data here. Uh, if I want to run this here over, um, this is somewhat bigger bigger machine, it, get, it should be able to get close to 10 gigs a second uh, for something like this. So um, so being able to, to play with these queries and have, have access for devs all the way in uh, for these kinds of things um, is, is super valuable. So instead of you know, dashboards being something that were set up once, now it becomes part of the interactive experience when you're both debugging, finding bugs, uh, and in general monitoring the system. Um, so that's uh, it's something we find um, that has a lot of value and it gives you, you know, ins total insights in, into your system. Of course, distributed systems are always difficult uh, and hard to understand, but this can just let you do it a, a little more. Uh, it, be a bit, a bit of help in that regard. So um, I think I'm going to end here and uh, and take questions um, uh, from the audience in case we have some. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Do you have a way to send alarms or set predict predictions as Datadog? 
Not currently. We um, it's one of the <laughs> the first things in our in our pipeline of things to do. Um, so alarms and alarms is definitely one of the first things that we're coming up with. So this is uh, the first DA release that we had. We've been working on this for n for nine months. Um, mostly Christian sitting there and me, uh, and now we. Over the last three or four, three months, we've been building up the team uh, with marketing resources and, and, and more. So now we're, we're seven people. Um, but there's, uh, that's, uh, that's obvious, uh, and it's quite easy to, to do something uh, like alerts, of course. But um, that's, well, that's one of the next. Right? Uh, we have some fairly large customers we're running tests at. Uh, that uh, we're letting those customers actually drive uh, the decisions. These first uh, few big test customers actually drive the uh, the pipeline of features we implement. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we, you're most welcome to come and, uh, and buy it. Um, so we're still in the process of figuring out what this should cost, to be, to be honest. Um, and, uh, and right now, you know, we're interested in reference customers. So that's, something, that's a bargaining chip you can come back with uh, at this point. Uh, it's more important to get reference customers than to get a lot of money at this point. Um, so we're hoping for uh, a price point of... 10k euro per node. Um, in many in many instances, you, you just want one, right? So, so we 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 don't want volume pricing. Uh, we want a, a fit. I mean, a pricing model is something that's annual subscription to run the supported software, yeah. and it's not open source. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much.